Welcome to Meet the Master series of Video GIE. My name is Sharif Andrawas. I'm a therapeutic endoscopist and the director of endoscopy at Staten Island University Hospital. Today, I have the honor and the privilege to introduce Dr. Gregory Haber, who is one of the world's leading experts in therapeutic endoscopy. Dr. Haber is a master endoscopist. He's an opinion leader. He is my teacher, also teacher and mentor to so many people throughout the years. We are excited with Video GIE to share your journey, Dr. Haber, welcome, Thanks. in medicine, in gastroenterology, and in endoscopy. Not many are fortunate to serve as a trainee or a disciple, as you like to call it, uh, and learn from the masters in the field. Uh, this is an opportunity to hear about your life story and learn from your wisdom and expertise. And I would like to start with the question that, you know, I always had in mind for you is what inspired you initially to go into the field of medicine, gastroenterology, and therapeutic endoscopy? You know, that, that, that's a big question, but um, I think, uh, I think, as I recall and think back to my early formative years, um, I, uh, I had this great desire uh, to really to, I guess, to help people in a altruistic sort of way when you're young and you feel you really want to make a mark on the world. And uh, gradually over time, you know, through high school and through studies, I came to understand that medicine would be the best, best vehicle for me to be able to sort of go out into the world and make a little bit of a difference to help somebody somewhere each day that I was working. So that was... Um, Sort of the inspiration, I would say, of a, of a young man uh, wanting to uh, go out into the workforce. Uh, and then as I um, got into medical school and was looking at different specialties and trying to understand where my fit was, um, I came across uh, a tremendous mentor. And I think nobody arrives where they are today uh, but on the backs of... Uh, other people who went before them. And just as an aside, as I talk to you, uh, having you as a, a trainee and, and somebody who is going along the same road as me, a few years behind though, um, you know, it, 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 it's something very gratifying to see the continuity of the education and mentorship and uh, what I hope eventually, you know, elevates our profession. So for me, uh, I, in, in my training, uh, uh, was, uh, came across a gastroenterolo gastroenterologist by the name of Kush Gigi Boy. Now, Kush uh, was uh, well known in his day uh, as the person who introduced, uh, introduced total parenteral nutrition. Now, that wasn't an area I was particularly interested, but I was really uh, overwhelmed by his passion, his fascination, his curiosity. Uh, and uh, it certainly was enough to convince me to go into gastroenterology, and then ultimately uh, going through gastroenterology, trying to decide where I would subspecialize uh, was, was the next question. So um, at that time, I had another mentor, Norman Markon. Uh, Norm was another great figure in, uh, in endoscopy especially, and uh, Norm was one of the early leaders uh, who had a tremendous passion and devoted his whole career to endoscopy. And, and when I was uh, finishing up my regular gastroenterology training, trying to decide what to do, um, I spoke to Norm and uh, I told him that I was interested in doing some basic research. And I was interested in doing research into bile acid metabolism. And poor Norm, I think he, he just about fell off his seat. He was... <laughs> so upset. Why would you do that? <laughs> That's not the way to become an endoscopist. In any event, he accepted the fact that I was going to pursue that for a while. And uh, so I went to, uh, to England, to the University of Bristol. I uh, received a Medical Research Council grant in Canada, where I did all of my training. And uh, the grant was to do bile acid uh, metabolism and research, which I did with uh, another great mentor, Ken Heaton. And uh, Ken, uh, Ken wrote a great monograph on bile acid metabolism. And in those days, that was quite topical. Uh, 
But uh, that's, uh, I think, where I hit the crossroads. So I pursued this so-called scientific uh, ambition to, to do more basic research. And when I went to Bristol, England, uh, the last of the mentors, I guess they're mentors all along the path, you know. <laughs> but Paul Salmon, who was the uh, president of the British Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. And Paul Salmon worked in the same unit as Ken Heaton and Alan Reed. These are all great figures in British gastroenterology. And uh, so the, when I got bored at the bench, uh, which didn't take long, I would sort of slip away, get my work done before noon, and I'd go and watch um, Paul Salmon uh, do endoscopy. And I guess that's where I got the bug. So when I saw that, I, I immediately realized that's something I could really take to. And it was an exciting time because in those days, uh, endoscopy was really virginal. It was just right at the very beginning. Uh, learning was the, through an eyepiece uh, attached to the fiber optic instrument, totally different than today. Um, so that, uh, so uh, I hung out with Paul Salmon, uh, and I remember clearly uh, him telling me one weekend, I'm, I'm going over to uh, Eppendorf uh, in Germany, uh, where there's a guy by the name of Verbst. He knows how to put a tube from the nose right down into the liver. And I thought, what? How, how would you do that? You know, so it was the first nasobiliary tube. So wow. we went there and we saw him do it. And the first sphincterotomies were being done, the first stone removals. And that's, uh, that was uh, the beginning. Uh, I went back to uh, Canada, and Norm Markon was thrilled. <laughs> he realized that I was going to join him uh, in therapeutic endoscopy and uh, not go back to uh, basic research. So there, there, that's kind of the, the launching, I guess, of Great my interest journey, yes. in career. Yeah. So I always thought, like you, you, you know, because you're, you're being a leader and an authority in the field of therapeutic endoscopy, what were the early days like when you started promoting a lot of these out-of-the-ordinary therapeutic endoscopy procedures? And I know that you're very creative. Until this day, you still, you know, bring ideas. You do things outside the ordinary, outside the box. You know, th how did surgeons take this? How did, you know, you know medical attending accepted a lot of these new yeah. innovative procedures? Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's always a fine balance. It's very, very tricky uh, when you're embarking into a new area, a new field, a new treatment. I think that applies right across medicine. So when we first mentioned that we were going to do sphincterotomy and remove bile duct stones, I mean, the surgeons were flabbergasted. You know, uh, you can't do that. That's not possible. There were editorials in the surgical journals that this was uh, adventurism. This was, this was not part of, um, you know, appropriate medical care. So we have to understand that, I mean, it's like politics, you know. We have conservatives, we have liberals, and uh, we have coalition governments uh, like in Italy today. So uh, it was really, I think, aligning yourself uh, with like-minded individuals. So there's not really, surgeons are not evil, gastroenter gastroenterologists are not evil, endoscopists are not evil. There's just uh, people have different viewpoints, and you have to align yourself with people who have the same approach uh, to, to what you're doing. And, and you have to also indicate that you have, let's say, uh, parameters that you're working under. You know, you're not going to do just anything. So it's very important as you go forward with anything you do, uh, work with your colleagues. So, and I was lucky even in, in the last uh, decade or last 10, 20 years to work with great surgeons who supported minimally invasive approaches, who uh, they themselves wanted to see the success of therapeutic endoscopy as a field. And uh, in, in a similar way, I mean, I love to hear what they were doing in the world of minimally invasive surgery. So we're, and with the radiologists too, with interventional radiologists. So all these fields are are kind of moving in the same direction. And that uh, synergy is very important uh, when you're practicing uh, wherever it is. It doesn't matter if you're in a remote area, a community hospital, you, you work together uh, with everybody. Um, so uh, I, I think that allows you, that gives you a certain amount of freedom. You know, accepting the limitations gives you the freedom. 
you know, if you work with, you know, the surgeon who you, 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 have, you have a backup plan. You never do anything new, novel, innovative without a backup plan. That's, that's the trick. Absolutely. So I know you're a very passionate teacher and have trained multiple fellows throughout the years. I'm privileged to be one of the disciples, as you like to call it. What are some of the best qualities to look for in a fellow or a person who would like or interested to become a therapeutic endoscopist? Well, I should get you to answer that because Thank you. <laughs> you exemplify that. Thank you. No, I, honestly, uh, Sharif, uh, you and, and others, of course, who have come along, uh, it's, it, it's really um, going into a field with a vision. You're not going to learn one skill or treatment of one disease. It's having the desire to improve, to advance, to, to go forward. And, and to realize, to get there, and that's what the Therapeutic uh, fellow, Endoscopy Fellowship is all about, you have to have the basics mastered. So... You know, and you and others who have, have gone in the same direction have taken advantage of every possible learning tool. You go to courses, you observe, you do ex vivo labs with animals or in vivo animal labs. It's that desire to get all the rudimentary elements of therapeutics under your belt. So that I think uh, when I recognize that in an individual, uh, I understand that they really, they, they want to move forward. They, they want to, you know, uh, get all the basics under their belt so that they can think to the future. Absolutely. And, and that's, uh, that's a very important aspect of, uh, of, of choosing a fellow. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. So how far did we come uh, as therapeutic endoscopists, and what do you think the future of therapeutic endoscopy holds? You know, it's really funny because when I think back, let's say 25 years ago, I thought that we had reached the limits, that we had done everything you could possibly do in therapeutic endoscopy. You know, we had um, chip scopes now, we had forceps to biopsy, we had snares, we did sphincterotomy. Uh, never in my wildest dreams at that time did I think that we would be uh, doing what we do today in terms of uh, submucosal endoscopy, if you like, um, full thickness uh, endoscopy, um, you know, extending certainly the, uh, uh, the uh, scope and, uh, of what we do, pardon the, pardon the pun. <laughs> but it's, it's just great now because, you know, we're developing tools to really go transluminal. And uh, you know, everyone, of course, knows notes. Notes had a few bumps along the way, but it mm -hmm. did create a mindset that uh, endoscopy is not purely luminal, that endoscopy is, is a roadmap to uh, exploring how we can handle and treat different diseases again in a minimally invasive way. So, you know, uh, as I've mentioned before, the full thickness resection now that we can do in the colon, the poem, the G poem, the Zenkers, um, the whole world of ESD and going forward you know, robotics, and there, there's so many exciting avenues now. Uh, and and the, end, the end game is let's get the disease earlier, let's cure it at an early stage, and let's do it with absolute minimal disruption of that patient's physiology, if you like. So, you know, we do it on an outpatient basis, um, you know, do it with quick recovery, uh, do it with the least disruption uh, to that patient. And uh, endoscopy, those are the goals of endoscopy, and it, it's great to be part of it. Oh, great, Dr. Haber. As you were in the front, forefront of advanced endoscopy, you had chances to create and improve techniques, devices uh, you, you know, that were established early on. How did you determine your new approach? Um, and, and what motivated you to push forward personally, and not to become content with the modalities that are just available for you? Yeah. Well, uh, I have to say I was lucky because um, I, uh, I learned my metier, if you like, uh, therapeutic endoscopy over a wide range of techniques, and realizing that all of these techniques relate to each other in one way or another. So whether it's understanding electric current, understanding 
metal, monofilament, braided, uh, barbed, understanding metal, you know, different types of metal, understanding braiding and stenting. So it's understanding the basics. Mm -hmm. And then, once you, again, once you understand those basics, then you let your imagination run a little wild, uh, which, which basically is, why, why don't we do this? Why can't we do this? What are we missing? What are we lacking? And, uh, you know, honestly, uh, I, I think that a lot of the creativity comes w from within, but a lot of it comes outside. I mean, you just happen to read something in the New York Times or, you know, you, know, you read about these uh, miniaturization of, uh, of electronics, and mm -hmm. then we say, why can't we have that in endoscopy? Or, or even something much closer to us. You look at the instrumentation of laparoscopy, the articulation that they have of all their instruments, the, the 3D imagery the uh, high resolution of the optics, all of those things, I think we have to push industry to provide those tools to us. I think that the one thing we are maybe lacking in a little bit is the, the uh, uh, advanced technology that's available in, uh, in, uh, in the instrument world and, mm -hmm. and accessory world. And of course, I think all of that goes first to cardiology, to the big you know, fields where there are cardiology and surgery, but we have to push to have those tools in endoscopy. And there's no reason why we can't have uh, a tool where we just hold it and, and we turn it this way and it'll, it turns exactly you know, two degrees inside. So we have to push for the instrumentation. So what I'm getting around to is we collaborate with industry. So there's half of our innovation comes from industry. We have to accept that, you know, that... Uh, our part, industry are our partners. And again, as much as we like to, uh, you know, create scenarios where, you know, it's just like money grubbing, whatever, you know, just trying to make a buck. Of course, industry has to be profitable. We accept that. But we work together. And I don't say that to patronize industry or, but I just say that it's part of the whole constellation of factors that lead to, um, a really uh, new or futuristic development or approach. Absolutely. So um, on any educational video or uh, during any life course, um, you make the procedure look so easy. And um, when we work together, you're always calm, cool, confident, focused. And have you ever had cases that made you flustered? And what were some of the most difficult cases that you know, have encountered in, in your career. I've always wondered, does Dr. Haber ever struggle? You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I sweat. <laughs> I can sweat, that's for sure. You know, I mean, I don't want to go into specifics necessarily. I would say that um, uh, it, it harkens back to what I said earlier on. I, when I'm doing something a little bit more difficult or more challenging, um, in the back of my mind, as always, will be, in the worst case scenario, how will I, what's my rescue? How am I, how am I going to sort of, uh, uh, you know, make sure that there's no devastating complication for that patient? So whatever I'm doing, whatever tool uh, I'm using or, or whatever orifice or whatever plane in the body I'm going to, I'm always thinking, what's my backup? Do I have the tools? Do I have the necessary um, instruments for a rescue procedure on that individual? So I would, you know, uh, uh, you know, like nowadays we, we have all kinds of newer things we're doing with endoscopic uh, ultrasound guidance and creating new anastomoses and, and I'm constantly thinking of all the parameters and, and, and what I need to rescue uh, a failed approach, a failed technique. And the other, I guess, sobering part of what we do is that um, no matter how good you are, how hard you try, um, there will be in your career uh, the demise of a patient because of what you have done uh, inadvertently. So in the world of ERCP, and I've done, as you know, 35,000 ERCP, whatever, um, there's no question that the devastating impact of an unexpected pancreatitis is, is unbelievably sobering and that we're always, you know, we have to always look to improve, and, and believe me, so many of our colleagues have worked so hard to try to rectify those unexpected complications. But I think that's uh, 
another area which I think is, is still it, it's sobering in terms of uh, what we're trying to achieve. Okay, so um, let's shift gears a little bit and say when not performing these meticulous technical procedures that you do, what do you enjoy doing the most? <laughs> well, um, you know, I, uh, I mean, I don't want to make it sound banal, but uh, I really, my whole life is my family outside of medicine. I mean, medicine is a very um, jealous uh, partner you know, and, and demands so much of your time, your attention, your effort. And, uh, and it really, it's hard on your, your partner, you know, your spouse, your children. And it's, uh, I think, in my free time, it's, it's, it's to share that time as much as I can with my family. You know what? I love biking. I love tennis. I, the things I love to do are things I can share often with my family. Um, and... Uh, uh, I love the outdoors and, and, and in a way, nature. Nature Absolutely, is a, yes. a wonderful, soothing influence, you know, after a hectic day. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the last few years, everyone has been talking about, like, physician burnout and, you know, and how do you, you know, manage, you know, such a demanding field. I've always, you know, seen you, like, you know, going between lecturing, doing procedures, to teaching someone, uh, speaking to teach and, you know, taking care of family. How do you manage your schedule day to day, you know? How are you, like, multitasking very well? <laughs> well, it, it all gets back to that that teamwork. I mean, I have a, a phenomenal staff, as you know, uh, in my office. I mean, I, I've been very blessed with uh, office administrators, uh, nurse practitioners, um, uh, nurses, and endoscopy nurses. So it's, uh, yeah, no man is an island. Everything, like, uh, I feel I'm maybe like at the upper end of a pyramid, but there's a huge base of supportive people who are phenomenal and uh, you know and I think the trick there is to share the same aspirations and goals so to make sure that uh, uh, when you have a lot on your plate uh, even for this DDW <laughs> with so much going on uh, as many of our meetings are like this um, I have staff who really make it seamless for me going from one step to the next so um, that's uh, it's it's made it a joy I think in the end what makes it uh, fun, enjoyable, and and long-lasting uh, are the uh, kind of the friendships and the people that you work with, that you work alongside. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So now, um, would you like to give us uh, an, an advice to help future endoscopists out about career development? Something from the master. Um, just follow your dreams. I think that uh, don't give up. Uh, if you have a passion, stick with it. There will be bumps along the road. There will be failures. But uh, try to uh, maintain a clear vision of what you want. And I think you'll generally get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Haber. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. It was you. a pleasure. Was Thank you. Thank you.